Well, hello to all of our podcast listeners and to our board ops at the LPFM stations across the country and to all of the amateur operators who put us up on their local repeaters. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1254 with a release and air date of Saturday, March 11th, 2023. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. On the air from coast to coast and around the world on the internet since 1993, serving the amateur radio community with weekly reliable amateur radio news and special features, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. We are the worldwide premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1254 with a release and air date of March 11th, 2023. Before we get into the latest news in depth, here is a quick look at the stories that are headlining this week in Amateur Radio. A half million dollar grant is awarded to develop low bit rate digital voice on the HF bands. The ARRL International DX contest was a roaring success. The QSL Virtual Ham Expo continues to announce new seminars. The latest is a presentation on creating your very first workbench. Three new amateurs are now aboard the International Space Station. Maliciously cut guy wires caused the structural failure of an emergency communications tower in Nebraska. President Biden's latest FCC nominee decides not to pursue confirmation. We will have all the details. The Dayton Hamvention announces its 2023 award winners. CQ Magazine announces its latest associate editor and is seeking nominations for the 2023 CQ Hall of Fame. And... We will tell you how, with the help of your handheld display device, visualize the RF in your shack. All of this and a lot more is straight ahead on today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories, of course, will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Let's take a look. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites that are in low Earth orbit. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio will answer the question, now that you have constructed a new antenna, either homebrew or commercial out of the box, what should you expect when antenna testing day rolls around? Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, is back, and he will be here to talk about the revolution that is all around us. The future is here. You just can't see all of those ones and zeros. Leo will also have a few suggestions on how to prepare an older computer that you may be planning to donate to a worthy cause. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at the third ever radio conference that was held in Cairo in 1938. How did amateurs fare at this conference? And Bill will give us an overview on what it was like to be an amateur in the late 1930s. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be here with some advice on how to replace that rusty old rotor on your tower. And we will have the latest news from Parks on the Air about their upcoming 48-hour POTA contest with Matt here, N3NWV. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where we are planning for yet another nor'easter snowstorm, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from the ham shack of K2MST in the Museum of Science and Technology in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our mountaintop ham radio site in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where <laughs> it's still snowing here, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the snowy shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Reporting to you from just outside the capital of Albany in Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. 
And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where we're back to the thaw part of the thaw free cycle, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're playing the clock hokey pokey this week, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Now, which way are the clocks supposed to go? And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. To advance the state of the art in HF Digital Voice and to promote its use, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, better known by the acronym ARDC, has awarded $420,000 to the Free DV Project. John Ross, KD8IDJ, has more in this report filed from League Headquarters. Amateur Radio Digital Communications, known as ARDC, has awarded a $420,000 grant, one of the first of 2023, to develop and document free DV. That's an open source amateur radio technology. The grant will be used to help advance the state of the art in HF digital voice and promote its use. Free DV is a graphical user interface application for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS that allows any SSB radio to be used for low bit rate digital voice. Speech is compressed down to 1600 bits per second, then modulated into a 1.25 kilohertz wide 16 qpsk signal, which is then sent to the microphone input of the SSB radio. The technology was initially developed by David Rowe, VK5DGR. Now an international team of radio amateurs are working together on the project. Among the many opportunities for free DV, the ARDC grant will also allow experienced digital signal processing developers to work with the volunteer staff to improve speech quality and low signal-to-noise ratio operation, making free DV performance superior to SSB over poor HF channels. And commercial HF radio companies to embed free DV at least into uh, two commercial radios, greatly reducing setup and effort and latency. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. With this grant, the Free DV project team will be able to do the following additional things. Continued development of a suite of advanced open source HF modems with the goal of making Free DV's digital performance comparable to Vera at both low and high signal to noise ratios. Continue support of the existing software library and application software and embedded Free DV adapters. Better promote Free DV online and in person at amateur radio clubs and conventions. The Free DV project team believes that the work funded by this grant will open the path to widespread adoption of a truly open source next generation digital voice system for HF radio, provide a mature open source low bitrate codec useful for a variety of amateur radio and commercial applications, and provide a suite of high performance HF data modems for open source data applications usable by any radio amateur. Free DV is a low bitrate digital voice mode for HF radio. Initially developed by David Rowe, VK5DGR, an international team of radio amateurs are now working together on the project. FreeDV is open source software released under the new Lesser Public License version 2.1. The modems and Codec 2 speech codec used in FreeDV are also open source. Hardware and software developers can integrate FreeDV into their projects using the FreeDV API. To operate FreeDV, radio amateurs either run the FreeDV GUI application on Windows, Linux, and OS X machines, or use the SM1000 FreeDV adapter. Either method allows hams to use a single sideband HF radio to send and receive FreeDV signals. The FreeDV website mentions some versions of the technology that are already in use, including the special version in use over the QO-100 geostationary satellite. FreeDV is also being employed to overcome poor propagation through experimental combinations of internet and HF radio. To learn more about FreeDV, go to www.freedv.org. That's www.freedv.org. Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communication. The organization got its start by managing the AmperNet address space, which is reserved for licensed amateur radio operators worldwide. Additionally, ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science. Such experimentation has led to advances that benefit the general public, including the mobile phone and wireless internet technology. ARDC envisions a world where all such technologies available through open source hardware and software and where anyone has the ability to innovate upon it. To learn more about ARDC, go to www.amper.org. That address again, www.ampr.org. 
You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available. The RRL International DX Contest was a success. Last weekend, March 4th and 5th, was the phone segment of the ARRL International DX Contest. With more details on how this year's running of the contest turned out, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. Although the deadline to submit logs is 2359 Zulu on March 12th, preliminary numbers already show an increase in submissions compared to the same period last year. Conditions were favorable for much of the world, and many operators took to social media to talk about their wins. Italian ham operator Chris Demos, IX1CKN, wrote in to express his gratitude for the contest, saying, I haven't come back to the U.S. since 2001, but I counted last Sunday afternoon as a true trip to the States from east to west. Demos had made 80 contacts in the United States. Demos operated during the contest from Ozine, Italy, in his parked car using QRP power from a Segu G90 transceiver and an Outback 1899 HF antenna. He enjoyed making a lot of contacts on 10 and 15 meters, which are opening up due to the Solar Cycle 25. He made a video with some of his QSOs and posted it to YouTube. And you can read more on this story and watch that YouTube video. The link is at ARRL.org. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is excited to announce that Joe Eisenberg, K0NEB, will be presenting Creating Your First Ham Radio Workbench at the upcoming event on March 25th and 26th, 2023. As an experienced amateur radio enthusiast and builder, Joe Eisenberg has spent countless hours perfecting his workbench setup. His presentation will cover the essentials of what makes a good first workbench for building electronic kits and working with amateur radio gear. Attendees can expect to learn about the various tools and equipment needed to build and maintain a workbench, including soldering irons, multimeters, power supplies, and more. Joe will also discuss how to organize and optimize the workspace to increase efficiency and productivity. Having a well-equipped and organized workbench is essential for any amateur radio enthusiast or builder, said Joe Eisenberg. I'm excited to share my knowledge and experience with attendees at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is an annual online event that brings together ham radio enthusiasts from around the world. Attendees can participate in live presentations, workshops, and demonstrations, as well as interact with exhibitors and other attendees. We're thrilled to have Joe Eisenberg presenting at this year's event, said Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, founder of the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. His expertise and passion for amateur radio and building will be a valuable resource for our attendees. To register for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo and attend Joe Eisenberg's presentation, visit QSOTodayHamExpo.com. The expo is organized by Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, and his team of dedicated volunteers. Again, for more information, that web address is www.QSOTodayHamExpo.com. A new activity being introduced this June by the Parks on the Air organizers is going to be different from the casual, portable outdoor operating experience activators and hunters enjoy. Here with all the details from Parks on the Air is Matt here and 3NWV. Howdy, Poda folks. I'm Matt and 3NWV, and today is an exciting day for Parks on the Air. We have just announced the 2023 Poda Plaque event. The date is June 3rd and 4th, UTC, so 0000 June 3rd to 2359 June 4th. For those of you new to Parks on the Air, the plaque event has been an annual occasion since 2018. It represents a way for operators, both activators and hunters, to distinguish themselves amongst the already distinguished crowd of POTA operators. The event is open to all licensed amateurs, 
who are members of the Parks on the Air program and who abide by the special event rules. Now, for the most part, the rules are just the regular POTR rules. There are, however, one or two caveats that you need to be aware of, some of which are new for 2023. The first change is that starting this year, we will not count QSOs made on the WARC bands for plaque eligibility. The WARC bands are still fine and dandy for day-to-day -day POTA use, including if you just want to do regular old POTA during the event. But note that because of the nature of the event, we have decided not to count QSOs made on 60, 30, 17, or 12 towards totals that will be considered for awarding plaques. What has not changed is that all valid modes still do count for POTA QSOs, and the standard POTA rules for determining what is a unique QSO haven't changed. The second change specific to the plaque event is the elimination of the ENFER multiplier for either QSO totals or park counts. You're still welcome to go and set up at an ENFER and log it for regular POTA, get credit for multiple QSOs and multiple parks. But for the purposes of the plaque totals, one QSO from one park at a time. If you are set up at an ENFER and you want to count all two, three, four, however many parks you're at, you're going to have to do it the old school way. You're going to have to go QRT at park number one and then fire up at park number two, even though you haven't moved, log them separately and redo the QSOs if you want to count them more than one time. Both of these changes are based in large part on community feedback. The goal is to make the event the best possible representation of our ham radio values and as equitable and inclusive as we possibly can make it. And under the category of inclusivity, we have included some new plaque categories in the awards section. Specifically, we've added rookie categories to both the activator and hunter sections. What's a rookie? Well, a rookie is somebody who's done the first one of either activating or hunting within the last 365 days prior to the event. So if you're relatively new to POTA, you now have a category where you can compete without having to go up against the big guns that have years of experience on you. All the new event details have been posted on all of the POTA properties. So you can check the docs on POTA.app, Facebook, Slack, Discord, whatever suits you to get all of the details and start your planning for the 2023 POTA plaque event. 7-3 and good luck. We'll see you there. Four astronauts, three of them licensed radio amateur operators, arrived on the International Space Station on Friday, March 3rd, for a six-month stay in orbit. One of them, astronaut Sultan al Nayadi, KI-5VTV, is also making his first trip into space. The Crew-6 launch took place a day earlier from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The other members of the team are Mission Commander Stephen Bowen, KI-5BKB, Pilot Warren Woody Hoberg, KB-3HTZ, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Andrei Fedyaev, who, like Al and Ayadi, is making his first spaceflight. The crew will conduct a variety of experiments, including a study on the way certain materials burn in microgravity, and an examination of microbial samples collected from outside the spacecraft. This is NASA's sixth crew to use the commercial SpaceX transport system. A communications tower serving fire and emergency services in Nebraska was found toppled and destroyed, the apparent result of having one of its guy wire anchors damaged. According to a report on the website ruralradio.com, the tower suffered structural failure and toppled, causing an estimated $575,000 in damage to the tower and its equipment. The local sheriff's office, fire and EMS service, Verizon Wireless, and the school district were among those making use of the tower. Cell phone service was reestablished on a temporary tower, and the emergency service and fire channels were moved to another location. The Nebraska State Patrol Forensics Evidence Team is studying the evidence at its crime lab and has contacted the FBI, which may pursue the case as an act of domestic terrorism. Looking for older editions of our news service? You can find them all as part of the Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications through the facilities of the Internet Archive. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio.
The 2023 Hamvention Awards Committee, chaired by Michael Coulter, W8CI, has announced the 2023 Hamvention Award winners. The Special Achievement Award recipient is Dr. Jason McDonald, MD, N2TPA. He's an active, well-known amateur extra class operator who earned his license in 2003. Dr. McDonald began as a radio frequency engineer before changing careers to become a trauma surgeon. Dr. McDonald's amateur radio interests range from operations on the air to international disaster response. His true passion is working with youths to promote amateur radio. Dr. McDonald brings amateur radio to the world through youth projects and scouting, particularly through radio scouting. Empowering youth through education is the goal of the clubs he's helped form. W1PTG is a testing group that Dr. McDonald helped create to offer exams in underserved areas and get more people into the hobby. This team of volunteer examiners graciously donates its time and money to ensure each licensee in the program receives mentor support and a radio. He's been instrumental in promoting international friendship and community through amateur radio by forming scouting clubs in Canada, VA7RSI, the Philippines, W1PTG, and DX1MC, and in Florida, KQ4GCK. To date, more than 500 youths in these clubs have been licensed and are on the air. The Amateur Radio Club of the Year is the Delaware Valley Radio Association, or DVRA, an AWRL-affiliated club formed in 1930 and serving the Trenton, New Jersey metropolitan area. The club has tripled in size over the last six years due to the wide range of amateur radio activities and events they offer. An all-purpose club, the DVRA's activities include public service events, operator training and mentoring, scouting events, informational monthly meetings, parks on the air events, and the operation of a world-class club station. The DVRA's center of activity is club station W2ZQ, which operates on a regular schedule. The station was renovated six years ago and currently houses two complete HF stations, a VHF repeater, an APRS digipeter, and a Winlink VHF RMS node. The recent addition of a 1296 MHz Earth-Moon Earth capability has been optimized with the assistance of member Joe Taylor, K1JT. Station activities include an open house, hands-on seminars, contesting, and special event activations. Most importantly, the exchange of ideas that occur within the walls of the building is priceless. The DVRA's focus on training and diversification in its projects attracts new hams and engages radio amateurs at all levels. The Technical Achievement Award recipient is Dr. James Brekall, WA3FET, whose work has been instrumental in amateur radio antenna technology for decades. He has teamed up with many experts in the field to develop state-of-the-art advancements with a wide range of applications, including the numerical electromagnetics code. As a professor of electrical engineering at Penn State University from 1989 to 2022, Dr. Brakall developed cutting-edge antenna technology and mentored his students in amateur radio, resulting in 700 new licensees. Now a retired professor emeritus, he serves as a consultant to the Army, Air Force, and Navy on many antenna-related projects. Nittany Scientific, a company initiated with his students, developed some of the first optimization methods applied to numerical electromagnetics code in a package called NECOPT, a design he called Optimized Wideband Antenna Yagi. The goals of the optimization were minimum peak SWR in a band, maximizing the lowest gain in a band, and maximizing the minimum front-to-back ratio in a band. These optimized wideband antenna Yagi designs have been used in numerous contest and DX stations around the world. Because Brakeall wanted this technology to be readily available worldwide, he has never pursued patent licensing. He was also the first to use helicopter measurements in geometrical theory of diffraction techniques for antennas in terrain at HF that led to software such as TA and HFTA. In 2010, Dr. Brakeall collaborated with Joe Taylor, Angel Vasquez, WP3R, and Pedro Pisa Jr., NP4A, to use the Arecibo 1,000-foot dish for Earth-Moon Earth. He worked on many antenna designs at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico and at the HARP facility in Alaska. Dr. Brakeall has frequently presented at Hamvention forums to share his expertise on antenna design and enthusiasm for amateur radio. As an avid amateur radio contester, Dr. Brakeall has built contest stations in Pennsylvania and Puerto Rico, and he has participated in more than 100 contests. He's also won a fair amount of them. Dr. Brakeall has authored numerous peer-reviewed scientific articles and books. The Amateur of the Year for 2023 is Karsten Dauer, DM9EE. He's been active in European amateur radio through the World Radio Sport Team Championship and Youth on the Air for over 30 years. Recently, he has spearheaded a movement that provides amateur radio equipment to war-torn Ukraine by collecting donations and personally delivering the approximately 5,000 kilograms of radios, power banks, solar packs, and first aid kits that have been shipped to Ukraine. 
Countless hours of planning, packing, documentation, and accessing permits have gone into this endeavor. On the return trips from Ukraine, Dower transports war refugees to havens in Germany, including his own hotel. Supporting fellow hams and inspiring youth involvement is Dower's passion. On his website, he states, Ham radio gave me a lot, and I try to give back to our great hobby. The world is very small when you have a radio license. You talk to the world, and eventually you also visit people in other countries. And you always learn more about culture when you know people there. Ham radio is a great way to learn languages, even if it's only a few friendly phrases. You can read more about the 2023 Hamvention Awards at their website or at awrl.org. The National Capital DX Association Board of Directors has appointed Jack Ference, W3KX, as the new AWRL Third Call Area Incoming QSL Bureau Manager. John Ross, KD8IDJ, has the details. He fills the position of the late Fred Lawn, K3ZO, who passed away on January 3, 2023. There were some delays in the transition, and QSLs that were forwarded to the old P.O. box were not able to be collected. Incoming QSOs that were sent between December 2022 and March 2023 were returned to the senders by the U.S. Postal Service. Please now send any returned QSLs and new shipments to the new address. That new address is W3 QSL Bureau, NCDXA, P.O. Box 190, Glenlake, Maryland, 21737. And that new address and additional information, including a link, is available at ARRL.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. That new address again is W3 QSL Bureau, NCDXA, P.O. Box 190, Glenelg, Maryland, 21737-0190. Amateurs who are in contact with active foreign QSL bureaus or international QSL managers are asked to pass this information along to them. Foreign bureau managers and international QSL managers are asked to contact Ference by email so their mailing address and contact information can be updated for future business. All questions and inquiries sent to the new P.O. Box will be answered. Ference can be contacted directly at Jack J. Ference, W3KX, Bureau Manager, ARRL, Third Call Area Incoming QSL Bureau, W3KX at ARRL.net. CQ Worldwide Contest Director John Doerr, K1AR, is seeking nomination applications for the CQ Contest Hall of Fame, which recognizes individuals who have made significant contributions to amateur radio contesting, both in support of others and in personal operating achievements. In addition, candidates should be known for having made significant contributions to the hobby at large. Please include the following information with your application. Name of person being nominated. Call sign, if they're a licensed amateur. If they have multiple call signs, list the most recent. If your nominee is still living, please apply their current contact information as well as a description of their accomplishments and achievements and why you feel he or she should be elected to the CQ Contest Hall of Fame. Nominating club and contact information. This is only for the purpose of contacting you in case of questions and will not be published. The name of the nominating club. Your contact name, mailing address, phone number, and email address. Nominations will be accepted until March 19th, 2023. Send your responses to K1AR via email at cqk1ar at gmail.com. That address again, cqk1ar at gmail.com. The 2023 inductees will be announced during a ceremony at the Dayton Hamvention Contest Dinner on May 20th, 2023. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. Visible light is just one part of the electromagnetic spectrum that astronomers use to study the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope was built to see infrared light, other space telescopes capture X-ray images, and observatories like the Green Bank Telescope, the Very Large Array, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, and dozens of other observatories around the world work at radio wavelengths. Radio telescopes are facing a problem. All satellites, whatever their function, use radio waves to transmit information to the surface of the Earth. Just as light pollution can hide a starry night sky, 
radio transmissions can swamp out the radio waves astronomers use to learn about black holes, newly forming stars, and the evolution of galaxies. With tens of thousands of satellites expected to go into orbit in the coming years and increasing use on the ground, the radio spectrum is getting crowded. Radio quiet zones, regions usually located in remote areas where ground-based radio transmissions are limited or prohibited, have protected radio astronomy in the past. As the problem of radio pollution continues to grow, scientists, engineers, and policymakers will need to figure out how everyone can effectively share the limited range of radio frequencies. One solution that has been worked on for the past few years is to create a facility where astronomers and engineers can test new technologies to prevent radio interference from blocking out the night sky. Radio waves are the longest wavelength emissions on the electromagnetic spectrum, meaning that the distance between two peaks of the wave is relatively far apart. Radio telescopes collect radio waves in wavelengths from millimeter to meter wavelengths. The problem of radio interference is not new. In the 1980s, the Russian Global Navigation Satellite System, essentially the Soviet Union's version of GPS, began transmitting at a frequency that was officially protected for radio astronomy. Researchers recommended a number of fixes for this interference. By the time operators of the Russian navigation system agreed to change the transmitting frequency of the satellites, a lot of harm had already been done due to the lack of testing and communication. Many satellites look down at Earth using parts of the radio spectrum to monitor characteristics like surface soil moisture that are important for weather prediction and climate research. The frequencies they rely on are protected under international agreements, but are also under threat from radio interference. A recent study showed that a large fraction of NASA's soil moisture measurements experience interference from ground-based radar systems and consumer electronics. There are systems in place to monitor and account for the interference, but avoiding the problem altogether through international communication and pre-launch testing would be a better option for astronomy. Even if you are unfamiliar with radio telescopes, you've probably heard about some of the research they do. The fantastic first images of accretion disks around black holes were both produced by the Event Horizon Telescope. This telescope is a global network of eight radio telescopes, and each of the individual telescopes that make up the Event Horizon Telescope is located in a place with very little radio frequency interference, a radio quiet zone. Sorry, a radio quiet zone. A radio quiet zone is a region where ground-based transmitters like cell phone towers are required to lower their power levels so as to not affect sensitive radio equipment. The U.S. has two such zones. The largest is the National Radio Quiet Zone, which covers 13,000 square miles, or 34,000 square kilometers, mostly in West Virginia and Virginia. It contains the Green Bank Observatory. The other, the Table Mountain Field Site and Radio Quiet Zone in Colorado, supports research by a number of federal agencies. Similar radio quiet zones are home to telescopes in Australia, South Africa, and China. As the radio spectrum continues to get more crowded, users will have to share. This could involve sharing in time, in space, or in frequency, and hopefully find new ways to share the precious natural resource that is the radio spectrum. The Software Defined Radio Academy has issued a call for papers for the 2023 Ulrich L. Rohde Award. With more details on this prestigious award, we go to League Headquarters, where John Ross, KD8IDJ, files this report. The award, named after Dr. Ulrich L. Rode, N1UL, was created in 2022 and is presented to those who have completed innovative research in the field of software-defined radio, or SDR as we know it. It's a paper award that requires a written submission by the applicants. There are first, second, and third place winners, and they can win in up to $500, $300, and $100. That's in uh, U.S. funds. All submitted papers are eligible for the award, and the deadline for the abstract submission is April 30th, 2023, and the acceptance notification date is May 15th, 2023. Dr. Rode is an avid amateur radio operator holding several licenses in the U.S. and Germany. He's been licensed since 1956 and is mostly involved in technology and system. In 2015, he won first place in the ARRLDX contest in the northern New Jersey section. He also operates N1UL-MM on his yacht, the Dragonfly, and he's trustee of the Marco Island Radio Club K5MI. Road holds 50 patents, uh, 50 patents rather, in December of 2016. He was invited to deliver the Sir J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture on Next Generation Networks, Software-Defined Radio, Emerging Trends at the IEEE meeting in Hyderabad, Telangana, India. And then in 2017, his fourth edition of the Communications Receivers book, Road and his co-author set SDR at the core of modern communication system design. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. For additional information on the Ulrich L. Rohde Award, including how to send an award for submission and other award categories, 
visit the Software Defined Radio Academy website. The search is on for a new nominee to join the U.S. Federal Communications Commission following a decision by President Joe Biden's nominee to withdraw. Gigi Sohn had been nominated for the vacant FCC seat, but announced on Tuesday, March 7th, that she would not seek the appointment because of what she characterized as personal attacks. The attorney is best known as a veteran public interest advocate. Her confirmation as commissioner would have given the Democratic Party a 3-2 majority on the FCC. According to The Hill, a Capitol Hill newspaper, Soane's decision came soon after West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin announced that he would not support her confirmation, which has been supported by most Democrats and opposed by most Republicans and many in the media and wireless industries. The White House has not yet indicated when the president might announce another nomination to fill the fifth commission seat. Little more than 18 months after the FCC approved the use of FM for citizens band on 27 megahertz, manufacturers have responded to the demand for the mode. Companies now in the market include President Electronics USA, Uniden, Radio Oddity, QYT, and COBRA. It was COBRA's original petition that pushed the need to the forefront of the agency, with support from the other companies. When the FCC granted the request in July 2021, the move was called the biggest change for Citizens Band since the expansion of CB channels from 23 to 40 in 1977. With more details on how the addition of FM brings 11-meter operations into the all-mode category, we go to our own Bob Donlan, W3BOO, who has the story. Bob? Calling it the biggest advance in 11-meter citizens band radio since the spectrum was expanded from 23 to 40 channels in 1977, Cobra Electronics has launched a line of 11-meter radios that can use FM as well as AM, now making 11-meter citizens band all mode. The company says the ability to use FM in the 11-meter radio spectrum 29.965 to 27.405 megahertz assigned by the Federal Communications Commission is a boon to truckers, off-road vehicle operators, and anyone else who uses the license-free two-way radio technology. It says the FM transmission CB radio mode provides users with the ability to enjoy high-quality, clear audio during radio conversations with nearby or strong CB radio transceivers. Meanwhile, in those instances where distance is a priority and or the signal from the other party is weak, AM can be used in either full AM or single sideband modes, consisting of upper sideband and lower sideband. Of course, the audio quality won't be as good, but that's the trade-off for distance. Cobra said its ability to offer FM in its CB radios is the fruit of four years of petitioning the FCC for permission to do so. To boost its case, the company sought input from the CB radio customers, sources from online CB radio forums, off-road vehicle clubs, and CB radio distributors. The strategy worked. The FCC granted permission for AM FM CB radios to be sold in the United States in 2021. Our team has been on the forefront of working with the FCC since 2016 to make AM FM CB possible, said Gail Babbitt, CEO of Cedar Electronics, parent company of Cobra, in a news release. The implications this will have on users like professional truck drivers, fleet managers, and local delivery services will be amazing, making communications clearer and more productive than ever while on the road. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Whoosh! Coming at you over to radio and the internet. The sound coming to my microphone is analog. This microphone goes into a mixer. The mixer goes into a digital box, which converts it to ones and zeros. And from there, 
there's no more analog until, in the case of this, it gets to the radio. You know, it goes through the air in an analog fashion, and your speakers are analog. Now, with television nowadays, no, it's once it's bits. Once it goes into that camera, and it's converted to ones and zeros, it's ones and zeros the rest of the way, all the way down, even into your TV set. That's, the, that's really the revolution that we're talking about here, the ones and zeros revolution. But we don't, we don't want anal- no more analog, all digital. Sometimes when I'm giving uh, speeches, I'll bring along with me a vacuum tube. Have you ever seen one of those? You old timers, people not my age, remember vacuum tubes. In fact, some of you audiophiles not only remember them, have them still. Because there's people out there, you know, you've met the person who says, oh, CD sound, that's terrible. That's not real. It was real when we had vinyl. Now, that was music because that was analog, wasn't it? And those, And some of those people, a subset of them, are even say, and by the way, those digital amplifiers, the ones with chips in them, no, you got to have vacuum tubes for that warm sound, that analog sound. Those people are listening to analog all the way. It's kind of amazing to think about it. It was only recently, this, and my kids are going to not remember this, but it was only within the last few decades that we went from completely analog music to completely, almost completely digital music. So nowadays when a, a musician comes into the studio, the, the mic is still an analog mic, pretty much, you know, the same design that Thomas Edison conceived of, where the, the sound waves, the compression waves from the voice go into the microphone, and then the microphone converts those into electrical signals, still analog, goes down the cable and those electrical signals, but in the modern recording studio, as soon as it hits the soundboard, boom, it's turned into bits. And it stays bits all the way until it comes out of your iPod into a speaker or your headphones, which are the are analog devices, which reproduce those sound waves. You know, the, the sound pressure created by the singer's voice vibrated that diaphragm in the microphone. That was turned to ones and zeros all the way through the iTunes music store into your iPod, which then sends out an electrical signal. It's an analog signal, and it causes the diaphragm on your headphones to vibrate the same way the diaphragm on the microphone vibrated and reproduces it. And, and, so, so we're still, you know, our ears are still analog, just as our vocal cords are still analog. Our instruments, in many cases, not all, are still analog. If you're using a synthesizer, that's digital. So in, in the, uh, in, in, until very recently, it was all analog. Those sound pressure waves that were made on the microphone were turned into electrical signals, which were sent down. And this is very amazing this even worked. Essentially to a needle that v- vibrated and in vibrating, cut grooves into the vinyl. Okay, I'm simplifying a little bit, but that essentially that's what happened. Those grooves then are replicate, you know, are, are basically a recording of the sound pressure waves. Grandma and grandpa used to do this, kids. They'd go to the record store and they'd buy a big piece of plastic that had a groove, one groove, all the way from the outside edge to the center of the big piece of plastic. That big piece of plastic. That groove, if you looked at it with a microscope, was looked like little vibrations. It looked like just, you know, <laughs> so we, we'd take that home and we'd put it on a thing that would turn at the same speed as the machine that was recording from the microphone was turning. And then we'd put a needle in it, very much like the needle that was used to cr- cut those grooves. And that needle would be vibrated by the grooves. <laughs> and it would turn the vibrations into electrical impulses that would be sent to an amplifier where vacuum tubes would be used to increase the sound pressure of it and 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 then would come out of our speakers. At no point at that with those vinyl records was it ever digital. It was all analog all the way. Is digital an improvement? Well, you know, you talk to those people with those magical golden ears, they're going to say, no, no, no. The, you, you, because, you know, if you think about it, what we have to do to make these ones and zeros, we have to take some information out. Analog. Now, there are all sorts of imperfections that get introduced by the microphone and the and the needle and the vinyl and the mastering and all that stuff, and even scratches and pops and clicks that get introduced on the record. But those imperfections, say these golden-eared folks, are minor compared to what you're doing when you digitize the music and you're tearing the guts out of it. In fact, there's, there are even psychologists who study this who say digital music doesn't move the soul, the spirit, in the same way analog music does because there's something intangible missing. I don't know if I could... I don't, I don't know if we can prove this. There's something intangible missing because in order to convert it to ones and zeros, we have to sample it. That's the process of taking small bits of that music, making a measurement of its frequency, and recording it as, as ones and zeros. So instead of a 
smooth waveform that's created by an analog sound, that sound pressure wave coming from my voice. If you look at it closely, you get a jaggy waveform because we can't record an infinite number of steps. We can only record, well, if it's 16-bit, we can only record 65,000 steps. So that's a, a, a CD, CD, so-called CD quality sound, is sampled 44,100 times a second. They measure the frequency. They take a slice of the frequency, and they represent that frequency as a 16-bit number, a number from 0 to 65,000. And they do that 44,000 times a second. Well, they miss a little bit. I mean, of course, inevitably. The point of the digital audio engineers say, well, you miss a little bit, but you don't miss as much as the ear misses. It's not the ear smooths it all together. In the same way that a movie at 24 frames a second clearly misses a lot, whatever happens in between those frames, but our eyes mush it all together and it looks like smooth flowing motion. But this transformation is huge. I mean, this is what, this is what we talk about on the show because when we took these analog sounds, which couldn't very easily be transported, you had to move this vinyl record around or you had to you know, kind of figure out a way to send it through the airwaves. It, it, was, it was kind of a primitive system. When you turn it into ones and zeros, there's a few things you can do with it. You can reproduce it an infinite number of times without any loss of quality. That's number one. Perfect copies. Number two, you can transmit it around the globe at the speed of light. That's, that's number two. Those are two very big changes. Suddenly, in fact, we saw it. That's what happened in the music industry, isn't it? In fact, that's what scares the record industry terribly, is you can make perfect copies of those songs as MP3s and transmit them <laughs> across the Internet at the speed of light. But it's also what's fueled the digital revolution. There's a third thing that happens, too, by the way, because it's, you know, you've got easy copying and easy transmission, but you also have, it makes it easier to modify because now you've got it ones and zeros. You can take that photograph, perhaps, and, and use Photoshop to change it, or the music, and use GarageBand to modify it, or, or, or the movie, and, 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 and use a, a, a video editing movie maker to, to modify it or edit it. Those things become much more easily done by a computer because it's digital, because it's ones and zeros. In old days of movies, they, had to use, they would wear white cotton gloves, and, they, and they'd use razors and scissors to cut the film and glue to paste it back together. That's how you edit it. So, so we gain something by these ones and zeros. And it's, a pretty, and it's pretty amazing. It's really what this digital revolution is. This is really what the show is all about, is what happens when you take pictures, movies, music, and you convert them into bits, how the world transforms, how the world changes. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Um, and I don't know what you do with those old computers. You know, uh, you can donate them. There are charities... Uh, like, uh, what was it, the Christina Foundation that will take old computers, recondition them. Uh, usually they'll, you know, wipe the drive, put Linux or something free on there and uh, give it to uh, charitable organizations that need computing power. You know, computers, uh, they, they, especially, you know, the computer you're buying today with no moving parts, you know, the hard drives will wear out. But the, with nowadays with SSDs, they're not going to wear out for a lot longer then the software will be useful for. This is the problem. You know, uh, the computers we got the computers we're buying today. They are very, very powerful. They'll go for a good ten, fifteen years uh, without becoming obsolete. But the software gets obsolete, right? So I love the idea of reconditioning, bringing back an old computer to life by putting a modern operating system on it. And I'm not talking Windows, and I'm not talking Mac. I'm talking an open source, free operating system like Linux. The reason is, uh, and Ubuntu is is, a, is the easiest one to use, especially if you're coming from Windows. It'll be very, very familiar. There, there are, by the way, hundreds of flavors of Linux uh, and for all different kinds of users. You know, there's very geeky Linuxes and there's Linux for novice. Ubuntu is a great kind of choice for anybody who's not used it before. Very easy to use. You install software from a store, just like as you would with Windows or Mac. Uh, with a click of the mouse, it's very straightforward. I think, frankly, com the, com the days of uh, proprietary commercial software are fading, believe it or not. Maybe for specialized stuff like video editing or photo editing. But uh, for the most part, how are you going to make a word processor better? And the free and open source version of Office, for instance, is as good as Office. How are you going to make Office better? How is Microsoft going to justify that 10 or 15 bucks a month they're charging for Office 365? It's not going to get that much better. It's been done everything you need to do for years, hasn't it? Hasn't I mean, what, <laughs> what feature is missing? So it, it, 
open source software has really kind of caught up, in other words. It's kind of what they're – and admittedly, they're building on the foundation that the co- private companies like Microsoft and Apple have created, copying in many cases what Microsoft Office can do. But at this point, there's a lot to be said, and, and you don't have to – for you by using free open source software, not only free – as in it costs nothing, more importantly, free as in liberty, as in free as in no commercial entity can spy on you, no government can spy on you. Uh, it's your, it's yours. You own it. And as companies like Microsoft and Apple and Google and Facebook get more and more in the mindset that we own you, you we don't work for you, you work for us, you're the product, We're, you know, then really that's how they're thinking, isn't it? When Microsoft puts a big blue window up on your desktop, as they are doing for the next few days, saying, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but you really ought to upgrade to Windows 10, covering everything you're doing, covering the men- everything you're doing, forcing you, even if you're in the middle of something really important, to pay attention to their ad, that's the time to turn your back on them, I, I say. And, and uh, start using software that works for you, not software you, that em- employs you. <laughs> I just think that's wrong. So go, by all means, if you haven't used it before, go try it. It's easy to try uh, Ubuntu. You go to uh, com. Uh, download it. You can put it on a USB stick or a CD or a DVD. You can actually try before you buy it. You don't have to install it. You just boot to that USB stick or you boot to the CD, start up your computer by booting not to your internal hard drive but to that external device and you'll be able to use it completely i mean it's a little slow because it's running off a usb stick but it's there and you can see how it works you can see if you like it you can try a lot of different versions of linux that way pick one you like if you're a mac user and you want something that feels and looks like mac there's elementary os that is designed to be a macish linux experience free open source Free as in money, but but more importantly, free as in liberty. And I think that's that's where computing is going, to be honest. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Cairo, Egypt, 1938. In the pre-war time of colonial empires, this conjures up an image of Europeans in white linen suits sitting on the veranda of a luxuriously decadent colonial hotel. Oppressive ceiling fans, dark, mysterious strangers, Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet. However... For amateurs, Cairo in 1938 meant a setback. The first international radio telegraph conference was held in Washington, D.C. in 1927. Although amateurs lost almost 40% of their allocations, the concept of amateur radio as a legal international hobby was established. The second conference was held in Madrid in 1932, and that produced no changes in ham radio. Now the third conference was at hand, but times had changed. Italy, Germany, and Spain were under fascist dictatorships. Stalin was directing a ruthless purge in the Soviet Union, and Japan was at war with China. The shortwaves were filled with propaganda broadcasts and military communications. Under this cloud of uncertainty, delegates from 71 countries assembled in Cairo on February 1, 1938. How would amateur radio be treated under these circumstances? Actually, American hams came out of the battle with no major losses. 
Despite the number of dictatorships at the conference, there was no attempt to destroy amateur radio, which, after all, allowed individual citizens access to receivers and transmitters. The most serious threat came from Japan, which proposed that amateurs be limited to 50 watts input. The Japanese plan was easily defeated. The ARRL had pushed for expanded HF bands, but the American delegation, mindful of the potential hostility at the conference, did not propose it. The headlines in the July 1938 QST summed up Cairo. American amateurs retain all frequencies after a terrific fight. USA puts up splendid defense. European hams shortchanged by greedy governments. And European broadcasting to invade seven megacycle band in late 1939. In Europe, the 7200 to 7300 kilocycle segment of the 40 meter band would be shared with broadcasters starting September 1st, 1939. They also lost half of the 80 meter band to broadcasting and other services, and the European 5 meter band was scaled back to make way for television. However, it could have been a lot worse. The next international conference was set for Rome in 1942. It never took place. In other 1938 news, the amateur population was stabilized at 50,000 after years of growth. This was partly due to the increase in the code speed from 10 to 13 words per minute in 1937. With regenerative receivers and crystal control transmitters, which meant that two stations having a QSO would probably be on two separate frequencies, many hams felt that 50,000 was the saturation point for our bands. On October 4, 1938, the FCC issued complete new amateur regulations. Included in the package were two new ham bands at 112 and 224 megacycles. What could hams do up there? Try amateur television. An all-electronic form of television was replacing the mechanical spinning disc, and QST carried several articles discussing the theory and construction of amateur TV stations. W6XAO was an experimental TV station in L.A., which would soon be followed by other pioneers, such as W2XBS. Where have I heard that call before? On September 2, 1938, the new Maxim Memorial Station, W1AW, was dedicated at 225 Main Street in Newington, Connecticut. The station was in memory of Hiram Percy Maxim, the founder and first president of the ARRL, who died in February 1936. Less than one month after Maxim's death, floods roared through the Connecticut River Valley and destroyed W1MK, which had been the league station. Later, in 1936, the ARRL Board of Directors allocated $18,000 to build a memorial station to honor W1AW, as well as to replace W1MK. The station would stand alone on Main Street in Newington until joined in 1963 by the ARRL QST offices, which moved from West Hartford. On September 13, 1938, Ross Howell, editor of QST, died after being electrocuted in his home. He had been working on a homebrew TV receiver. Ross was a native of Australia and held the call 3JU while living down under. He did not hold a U.S. license because the citizenship application was not finalized. Despite his lack of American amateur privileges, Ross Hull was instrumental in early VHF-UHF developments. He designed practical and inexpensive 5-meter stations and greatly contributed to the knowledge of VHF-UHF propagation. His death dramatically pointed out the dangers of working on live circuits, and for months thereafterwards, QST ran articles on how to switch to safety. No discussion of 1938 would be complete without including the Great Hurricane. In the fourth week of September, New England and Long Island already soaked by previous rainstorms, were pounded by the unnamed hurricane, which was completely unexpected. Over 600 people died, and damage was $500 million in 1938 dollars. The new W1AW Memorial Station, just three weeks old, survived without any damage, although power was lost for 36 hours. 
Hundreds of amateurs grabbed whatever generators and batteries they could find and set up emergency stations on 5 meter AM and 160, 80, and 40 CW. Amateurs were the only source of communication for dozens of communities and handled everything from health and welfare traffic to police communications. It was a superb demonstration of public service at its best. In our next installment, we will look at amateur radio in World War II. Yes, amateurs were off the air, but what did they do if they weren't in uniform? What filled the pages of QST? And what was this WORS? Join me as the ancient amateur archives seeks the truth. AMSAT is looking for an electronics engineer with radio frequency experience to join its Fox Plus team. To tell us more about these exciting positions within AMSAT, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. The team will be a collaboration of up to 10 electrical, mechanical, software, and systems, and engineer volunteers. It will also be an opportunity to design and build the RF communications subsystems for a series of low Earth orbit 1U and 3U CubeSats to support AMSAT's educational engineering objectives. Mechanical engineers are also needed to join AMSAT's Fox and Golf CubeSat teams. They will be a collaboration of an all-volunteer team of up to 12 electrical, mechanical, software, and systems engineers. These positions will entail an opportunity to use structural design and analysis skills to develop a series of low Earth orbit and highly elliptical orbit of U1 and U3 CubeSats. AMSAT volunteers are typically uh, work about five hours a day per week, and they, uh, in their projects, uh, to attend weekly meetings online. An amateur radio license and CubeSat experience are helpful, but not necessary. U.S. citizenship or proof of permanent residency is required. Interested persons should send an email with their resume and curriculum to volunteer at amsat.org. I'd like to thank AMSAT Assistant Vice President of Engineering, Jonathan Brandenburg, K-F-Y-I-D-Y, for the above information. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Taking a closer look at a few of the requirements for the electronics engineering position, you should have a working knowledge of analog and digital communications protocols. For example, FM, PSK, FSK, to provide digitally synthesized audio for FM modulated VHF, UHF, SHF voice and telemetry channels. Development opportunities can begin with modification of previous Fox designs and or by starting with a blank sheet for an original design. For the mechanical engineering position, your contribution may include the development of the space frame and deployable solar panel subsystem, the analysis of the thermal characteristics of the CubeSat, and the design of the thermal management system, and preparation and oversight of the environmental testing procedure and or management of documentation of the CubeSat's adherence to the launch providers and space vehicle owners specification. Again, interested persons should send an email with their resume curriculum vitae to volunteer at amsat.org. Again, that's volunteer at amsat.org. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. foundations of amateur radio. Last week I went outside. I know, it was a shock to me too. The purpose of this adventure was to test an antenna that has been sitting in my garage for nearly a year. Together with a friend we researched our options and at the end of the process the Hustler 6BTV was the answer to our question. Before the commercial interest police come out of the woodwork, I'll point out that I'm not providing a review, good or bad, of this antenna. It was the antenna I purchased and went to test. Between the two of us, we have three of these antennas. I have the idea to use one as a portable station antenna and another as my base station antenna. Glyn, Victor Kilo 6 Papa Alpha Whiskey, intends to use his as a base station antenna. 
To set the scene, the antennas came in quite large boxes, just over six bananas long, or more than 180 centimetres. When they arrived, I opened my boxes and checked their contents, then sealed it all up and put the boxes on a shelf. Last week, Glyn proposed that we set one up and see what we could learn from the experience. You know that I love a good spreadsheet, so planning went into overdrive. Well, I put together a list of the things we'd need, starting with the antenna and ending with sunscreen to protect my pasty skin from the fusion experiment in the sky. In between were things like an antenna analyzer, spare batteries, tools, imperial, since apparently there are still parts of the world that haven't gone beyond barley measurements. I jest. They authorized the use of the metric system in 1866. My list also included a magnetic bowl to capture loose nuts and washers. You get the idea. Anything you might need to test an antenna in the field. Our setup was on a rural property where we had lovely shady trees and oodles of space to extend out a 25 metre radial mat. We tested many different setups. I won't go through them all, but to give you an idea of scale, in the time we were there we recorded 40 different antenna frequency scans. The 6BTV antenna is suitable for 80 metres, 40 metres, 30 metres, 20 metres, 15 metres and 10 metres. We tested with and without radials, raised and on the ground, and several other installations. We learnt several useful things. For starters, sitting on the ground with radials, the antenna measurements line up pretty well with the specifications. And with a suitable base mount to protect the plastic base, the portable station antenna is usable out of the box. Any variation on this will result in change, sometimes subtle, sometimes less so. For example, we came up with one installation where the SWR never dropped below 3 to 1. That's with the antenna on the ground without any radials, in case you're wondering. Other things we learned were that manually scanning each band is painful. When we do this again, we'll have to come up with a better way of measuring. The aim for my base antenna is to install it on my roof, bolted to a clamp on the side of my metal pergola. This means that we're going to have to do some serious tuning to make this work for us. It might turn out that we'll start with installing the antenna at Glynn's QTH first, but we haven't yet made that decision. Other things I learned are that I actually put together the base clamp when I checked the boxes a year ago, so that was a bonus. The magnetic bowl saved our hides once when a spring washer fell into the lawn. The hose clamps that come with the antenna require a spanner, but there are thumbscrew variations of those that I'll likely use for my portable setup. Other things we need to do is learn exactly how the traps work, and how adjusting them affects things. In case you're unfamiliar with the concept of a trap, think of it as a radio signal switch that lets signals below a certain resonant frequency pass, and blocks signals above that frequency. In other words, a 10 meter trap resonates just below 28 megahertz. It lets frequencies below 28 megahertz pass, but blocks those above it essentially reducing the length of the antenna to the point where the trap is installed. One test we did was to only use the base and the 10 meter trap. We discovered that this doesn't really work and that the metal above the trap, as in the rest of the antenna, isn't just for show, even though it's on the blocked side of the 10 meter trap. Given that I intend to use my base antenna as my main whisper transmission point, I need to adjust things so the antenna works best on whisper frequencies. I intend to use a tuner for when I want to work outside those frequencies. One unexpected lesson was that the awning that Glyn attached to his vehicle was an absolutely essential item. I don't think I'll ever go portable again without one. Life-changing would be an understatement. I'm investigating if I can fit one to my vehicle. Having had some health issues over the past months, I was anxious about going outside and being somewhat active. I paced myself, protected my back, took regular breaks, sat down a lot, drank litres of water and slept like a baby that night. No ill effects. Very happy. As a bonus, I even transferred our measuring data to a spreadsheet. I can't wait to see the results of our next adventure. Oh, we did connect to radio. Heard a beacon in Israel, heard a QSO in Italy, listened to WWV on 10 MHz and almost missed the bliss of not having to tune or switch when moving from band to band. What have you been up to in the great outdoors? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Sabrina Herman, KB3, UJW of Lyndhurst, Ohio, has been named CQ Magazine's Associate Editor 
succeeding managing editor Jason Felbin, KD2IWM, who is leaving CQ Communications after 12 years to pursue opportunities outside of publishing. Herman has been a ham for close to 13 years and comes to CQ from Hermes Press, a small book publisher in Pennsylvania where she served as managing editor and promotional coordinator. At CQ, she will be an integral part of the editorial team, producing each issue of the magazine and will work to expand CQ's social media presence as well. Herman says she hopes to learn more about the ham community in her new position, noting that nearly all of her friends are hams, including her husband, Jacob, about whom she says, he's the reason I decided to take the license exam back in 2010. I have two dogs, Ginger Rogers and Noodle, she adds. I'm an avid collector of Disney paraphernalia, books of all kinds, and original comic book art. I play lots of Nintendo Switch games, my favorite being Animal Crossing. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station has announced that several schools are planning to communicate with orbiting astronauts in the coming weeks. Lanai High and Elementary School in Lanai City, Hawaii, will attempt the contact between March 20th and 24th, 2023. Students attending the high school already study amateur radio and the research being done on the ISS, among other scientific pursuits. Stone Magnet Middle School in Melbourne, Florida, will make their contact between March 27th and April 1st, 2023. In their application, Stone Magnet wrote that they work to inspire students to develop interest in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics careers. The school has a special program for science research, and students from that program place well in district and statewide science fairs each year. ARIS is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. In the U.S., participating organizations include NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program, the ISS National Lab Space Station Explorers, ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and AMSAT. ARIS is presently seeking contact proposals for the next round of school selections. Amateurs in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Northern Asia are being asked to take the challenge of seeing into the future. Region 1 of the International Amateur Radio Union is inviting teams and individuals to engage in two types of brainstorming as part of the region's ham challenge competition. Both challenges are designed to inspire projects that increase awareness of amateur radio's vitality and relevance today. The first challenge asks hams to create projects that reach out to people who don't have a radio license. The project could be a social media campaign, a video, a storyboard, or some other creative venture that showcases the power ham radio has in building friendships and expanding scientific knowledge. The second challenge focuses on the project that reaches out to other hams, showing the way amateur radio might work in 10 years. Entries in this part of the challenge can be a technology project, an experiment, or something else. All ideas should be sent to the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 by July. Proposals should be sent by email to hamchallenge at iaru-r1.org. There are monetary prizes and a chance for the winners to carry their message to a wider audience. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This Week in Amateur Radio. Bruce Page, KK5DO, has filed this week's AMSAT report. And have you thought about roving and operating satellites, you ask? Well, there are many that go hiking, camping, or simply take a road trip. And it is a lot of fun to be on the side of a road, in a parking lot somewhere, or on the top of a mountain and operate a satellite from there. For one, you get to earn the AMSAT Rover Award, or you can earn the AMSAT Reverse VUCC Award. And yes, there are many that have operated from over 100 different grids and a few that have hit above 300. Bruce KK5DO once operated from the road in a cemetery on a grid line to be able to give out both grids one on one pass. Back in 2016, AMSAT had their annual symposium aboard a cruise ship. And they were all on deck, said Bruce, operating many passes of the satellites. It was really fun, he said, and one of the, his best friends, Andy, W5ACM, who is now a silent key, was standing right next to him, and they worked each other, really, on a quick pass. And, yep, their signal had to travel 600 miles up and 600 miles down to reach them standing just three feet apart. 
And Bruce says that if you'd like to really make someone happy, ask on the AMSAT bulletin board what grids in a particular area are needed and work those grids hands. They're trying to fill their AMSAT Gridmaster Award, he said, and map towards working all of the grids in the continental U.S. Thanks for the report, Bruce. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that so far this month, two new sunspot groups appeared on March 1st, one more on March 2nd, three more appeared on March 3rd, another one on March 5th, two more on March 6th, and the final one appeared on March 7th. The average daily sunspot numbers rose from 126.3 to 143.6, and the average daily solar flux changed from 158.2 to 181.6. The average daily planetary A and dice declined from 27.7 to 14.6, and the average middle latitude numbers went from 18.9 to 10.7, reflecting the quieter conditions following the upsets of the week before. The Penticton Observatory, the source for the solar flux data, is way up at 49.5 degrees north latitude in eastern British Columbia. For much of the year, the sun is low in the sky, so all winter they do their thrice daily readings at 1800, 2000, and 2200 UTC. But on March 1st, they shifted over to 1700, 2000, 2000 and 2300 UTC. The local noon, that's 2000 UTC reading, is the official solar flux for the day. The vernal equinox, when the northern and southern hemispheres are bathed in equal solar radiation, is less than two weeks away now. So the predicted solar flux values are peaking right now and will again on March 16th through the 19th. So taking a look at the expected flux values, they are 172 and 165 on March 11th and 12th. 170 on March 13th and 15th, 175, 180, 180, 175, 170, and 165 on March 16th through the 21st, and then dropping back to 160 on March 22nd and 23rd. Finally, looking at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 8, 10, and 8 on March 11th through the 13th, 5 on March 14th and 15th, 8 on March 16th and 17th, 5, 8, and 16 on March 18th through the 20th, and remaining at 5 on March 21st through the 23rd. In Radio Sport this week, the year-long ARRL Volunteers on the Air VOTA continues. You can see the state activation schedule for their weekly W1AW portable operations, including these, March 8th through the 15th in Kentucky, W1AW slash 4, March 8th through the 15th as well in Idaho, W1AW slash 7, March 15th through the 21st in Virginia, W1AW-4, and March 15th through the 21st in Ohio, W1AW-8. And an upcoming contest on March 11th is the YBDX Ritty Contest. That is digital. March 11th and 12th, the RSGB Commonwealth Contest. That's CW. March 11th and 12th as well, the EIPSK-63 Contest. That's digital. March 11th and 12th, South America 10-meter contest, CW and phone there. And March 11th and 12th, the SKCC Weekend Sprintathon. That is CW. And some upcoming section state and division conventions. March 18th, it's the Mark St. Patrick's Day Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL West Texas section. That's in Midland, Texas. March 18th, the Charleston Area Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL West Virginia section convention. That's in Charleston, West Virginia. And on March 24th and 25th, the ARRL Maine State Convention and Ham Fest. That's in Lewiston, Maine. This year's Virginia QSO party includes a bit of an experiment. Organizers are adding a new category, Rover, which raises the number of categories for non-fixed stations to three. The inclusion of the Rover category, which now joins Mobile and Expedition, is being done to accommodate hams who, for various reasons, cannot be included in the other classes of mobile operator. That may mean they make use of commercial power, retractable antenna masts, or non-mobile support structures. Rover operators must still identify with their call sign, followed by stroke M. Rovers are permitted to make contacts while moving or stationary. A non-operating driver is required for rover and mobile operators who plan to be on the air while the vehicle is in motion. The QSO party is being organized by the Sterling Park Amateur Radio Club and will be held on March 18th and 19th. 
FCC Commissioner Nathan Symington, who has been an outspoken opponent of carmakers' plans to remove AM broadcast radio from electric vehicles, has been joined by seven former officials in the United States Emergency Management Agency. In a letter to U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, the seven praised AM radio's capacity for long-distance communications, making this broadcast mode a vital public safety system. Commissioner Symington spoke late last year at a convention of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters and for much the same reasons described AM radio as the essential spine of the emergency alert system. Symington said he agreed with the letter written to the Transportation Secretary and called the push to keep AM radio in electric cars a matter for urgent attention. A number of automakers have stopped including AM radios in their vehicles, claiming the cars cause electromagnetic interference with AM signals. Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts recently asked, a number of car makers, including American Honda, Jaguar, General Motors, Kia, and BMW, to declare their intentions regarding AM and FM radio reception in their vehicles. The newest net in Ireland is called Nervous Novices, organized by Eamon Amo Gannon, EI7LC. The 80 meter net is designed to encourage newcomers to CW to get on the air without feeling as if they needed to be proficient enough for a full rag chew. Check-in begins from 2030 local time, meeting somewhere between 3.550 and 3.555 megahertz. Amateurs are encouraged to operate QRS to accommodate the slowest participants. The emphasis is on good operating practices, not speed. Get on the air and listen for the call. CQ, NNCW. Skywarn and emergency managers in Sussex County on the Delaware Peninsula hold quarterly exercises they call pop-ups, recognizing that unexpected emergencies pop up. The latest exercise, called Pops in the Dark, began on Saturday, March 4th. It called for all AMs on deck in Sussex and Kent counties. Amateurs were mobilized without commercial power and throughout the activation were limited to only whatever fuel and battery capacity they had at the time. The exercise was a severe winter storm with reported ice accumulations and 10 to 12 inches of snow. The event had two parts. On day one, the emergency operations center nets worked simultaneously with Skywarn and then remained active throughout the remainder of the exercise. On days one and two, repeaters were reported down and only simplex frequencies were used. Barbara Dean, KC3LGE, Public Information Officer of Sussex, said that in addition to coordinating various communications tasks, the Nets also included suggestions on getting the most out of their available power. Pops in the Dark concluded on March 8th, followed by the collection of after-action reports. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Replacing rotors on towers is not a fun job. They usually sat for a long time before we decided to replace them, so the bolts and screws will surely be nicely rusted. I know, I have one on my tower right now, too. I've done this job a few times in the past, so let's look at the three primary types of installations. From my experience, rotors are mostly installed inside the tower near the bottom or inside the tower near the top. They can also be on the top of the tower outside of the tower frame. By far, the worst one to work with is the last, the rotor on the very top and outside of the tower. If you do not have the proper gear, tools, strength, and experience, I recommend you hire someone with a cherry picker to do this job for you. If you have the expertise to safely perform this task the way I do them, 
After deciding the tower is strong enough to survive the job, I mount clamps to the side of the tower, remove the mast from the rotor, and slide it into my temporary clamps. Swap out the rotor and reinstall the antenna mast into the new rotor. This has to be done on a windless day. As an added precaution on smaller TV antenna grade towers, I always add temporary guy ropes to secure the tower from the tremendous shaking and stresses one of these rotor swap out jobs can put on any tower. If the tower is a fold over type or a roof mount type, I usually refuse to do the job unless the tower is guyed at every 10 to 15 feet with steel cable. I have never done work on a fold over tower above the hinge and neither should you. On towers where the rotor is inside the tower, there is usually some plate or place to install a U-bolt clamp above the rotor. Then I loosen the clamps that hold the mast inside the top of the rotor, slide up the mast, and now tighten the bolts on the U-bolt above the rotor to keep the mast from sliding back down into the rotor. A suitable temporary clamp which can hold some weight is a hefty vice grip pliers. On towers without a clamping plate of some type above the rotor, I have used the 2x4 stuffed into the tower in its place. Essentially, the rotor removal job is the same process regardless of the location of the rotor inside the tower, either at the bottom or at the top. If the rotor is inside the tower near the top, bending the mast pipe is the big risk. So always insert a wooden doll rod inside the mast pipe to prevent bending. The doll rod should be close to the same size as the inside of the mast pipe or it won't prevent bending. These are generally available at your local hardware store. Otherwise, a fat broom handle may fit inside the mast pipe just fine too. Some people insert a second steel pipe that is a tight fit inside the section of mast pipe that passes through the top of the tower and pin it to keep it in place. When replacing the rotor, another trip to the hardware store should be done first to replace all those cheaply plated screws, nuts and bolts with stainless steel parts. This may be time consuming, but you'll be thankful you took the time years down the road when the new rotor is ready to retire. Otherwise, you'll become an expert with a hacksaw on the tower, which ain't fun. If you decide to hire this job out, be sure to check the yellow pages for companies that trim trees. Their work is largely seasonal, so you may be able to negotiate a lower price for the work if you are willing to wait maybe even months for the truck and be ready to go when they call you and tell you that today is your lucky day. From my experience, tree service people are generally cheaper than TV and tennis service places too. One topic I already mentioned, which is worth repeating, never work on a standing fold-over tower above the hinge. Never climb a base fold-over or roof-mounted tower that is not guide every 10 to 15 feet. Best bet is to never climb any fold-over tower. You should add temporary guys to any light-duty TV antenna tower. And lastly, do what I do. When someone asks you to climb their tower for them, always tell them you reserve the right to stop the job at any time for any reason if you feel your safety is in question and you will not argue or debate about restarting a job which was stopped for safety concerns. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. It is with deep sadness that we report that ARRL Michigan Section Manager Les Butler, W8MSP, passed away on March 8, 2023. Butler of Gregory began serving his first term as section manager in January 2022. Les was attending Michigan's statewide interoperable communications conference and, in the evening, became ill, reported Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, in a message sent to division members. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Les's wife Karen, the family, and all of his many friends in amateur radio. We will have more information as it becomes available. IO-117 continues to provide a lot of DX fun for amateur satellite operators. Numerous satellite operators have reported receiving the IRRL's Worked All States and the DX Century Club Satellite Awards, lately as well as CQ Magazine's Worked All Zones Satellite Award, where 25 of 40 zones is required for the award. For example, the distances that are about to be worked via this satellite in medium Earth orbit Two CUSOs got very near to the 13,000-kilometer mark. On February 11, 2023, Dave Fisher, 
KG0D worked Lucky Bianchi, VU2LBW. The distance between KG0D in ECN88KD and VU2LBW is 12,939 kilometers. Unfortunately for this claim, Hector Martinez, W5CBF, worked Oleg Vachin, A65BR, on January 29th at 2100 UTC. The distance between W8CBF and A65BR is 12,996 kilometers. Note that only real-time QSOs will be considered for distance records. Under ARL's current interpretation of these award rules, satellite QSOs involving delayed messaging or store and forward systems are not valid for WAS, DXCC, or VUCC. Thus, QSOs made over multiple orbits using this method will not be considered for inclusion in the AMSAT Satellite Distance Records Archive. Also, please note that the distance calculator at k7fry.com slash grid is used to calculate all distances for the AMSAT records. This may not provide the most accurate distance under the most recent geodetic datum standards, but it is a consistent reference. Anyone who wants to claim a distance record via amateur satellite should look at the current list at www.amsat.org slash satellite dash distance dash records and email nhhm at arrl.net if they complete a new distance record. Audio and or video of the QSO is encouraged but not required. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. Finally this week, we have this for you. Intellectually, we all know that we exist in a complex soup of RF energy, cellular, Wi-Fi, TV, public service radio, radar, ISM band transmissions from everything from thermometers to garage door openers. It's all around us. It would be great to see these transmissions, but alas, most of us don't come from the factory with the correct equipment. Luckily, aftermarket accessories like Radio Field AR by Manahio make it possible to visualize RF signals. As the name suggests, this is an augmented reality system that lets you inspect the RF world around you. The core of the system is a tiny SA, a pocket-sized spectrum analyzer that acts as a broadband receiver. A special antenna is connected to the tiny SA. Unfortunately, there are no specifics on the antenna other than it needs to have a label with an image of the Earth attached to it for antenna tracking purposes. The tiny SA is connected to an Android phone, one that supports Google's AR core, by a USB OTG cable, and a special app on the phone runs the show. By slowly moving the antenna around in the field of view of the phone's camera, a heat map of signal strength at a particular frequency is slowly built up, and the results are pretty cool. If you don't have a tiny SA, fear not. Manahio has a version of the app that supports a plain old RTL SDR dongle too. That should make it easy for just about anyone to try this out. For more information, you can visit the Inspect the RF Realm page on hackaday.com. Again, that's on hackaday.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesque in Brunswick, New York. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the International Telecommunications Union, the 425DX News, Parks on the Air and the Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. 
With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you a 73.